The sleep epidemic started in the 1980s. And one of the important things about my belief system is I live before and after. So I was actually alive in the late 60s, early 70s, when Stanford Sleep Study Center began, and my generation would have been the first sleep studies that they did. So one of the important points is we started studying sleep very late. It's only really 50 years in duration. So I think when air conditioning, sunscreen, and moving indoors because of computers, and COVID just exaggerated that, when we moved indoors, our biology stayed the same, but our biology was created when we were living outdoors. One of the most important factors is vitamin D that we make when sun touches our skin. And as we've been encouraged more and more, and I was alive when the dermatologist came out in the early 80s and said, sunburn is bad for you. But over the last 40 years, that's become more and more and more exaggerated. So that American Academy of Pediatrics says that your kids shouldn't be touched by the sun until they're six months old. That is not normal. Uh, children that did well, who had a normal immune system, were strapped on mom's back and still outdoors because that's the way we've lived. And if you count all the hominids, all the human-like walking upright, we've been on this planet for 300,000 years. That means we lived outside like every other animal. In the final analysis, D is just one of the things that affects our sleep. So there are multiple other wavelengths of light and energy wavelengths that affect our biology. And medicine is very conservative. They are very slow to adopt things. One of the fascinating parts about being a practitioner on the internet now is people have the opportunity to talk about their published articles, to talk about their thoughts. Some of it's wacky, but it turns out that there's a lot of basic science being done about energy wavelengths and how it affects our biology. And vitamin D is a very important part because medicine has completely ignored this hormone and they have misnamed it a vitamin. They've considered a nutrient that has some good and bad aspects. The good aspect is lay people can go and buy it themselves. They don't need a prescription. The bad aspect is that the medicine that I was trained and is still being trained is not understanding and viewing this chemical as the hormone that it is and does not understand the importance of it. The science is phenomenal and it is advancing at an incredible rate. The general clinician who's having to face the patient does not know about D and have actually been somewhat brainwashed, especially in the last five or 10 years. The confusing part of this is that we have these names for things. When we have names for things, we then treat the whole group as though it's that thing and we think we know about it. So this was called a vitamin. That means that for the last really 20 years, the prospective controlled trials, that means we have many, many articles showing that vitamin D deficiency exists next to a hundred different diseases. These are called epidemiologic studies where is there a correlation? If your D is low, are you at higher risk for diabetes? If your D is low, are you at higher risk for miscarriage? Uh, there are hundreds of studies those all show that vitamin D is involved in multiple organs in the body and it plays a bunch of roles. Unfortunately, the studies that are done to help the clinician know how to use this chemical. So my job as a clinician is I read the science, I read the articles, but the very logical question they have is, well, if diabetes is associated with a low vitamin D, then you should be able to give vitamin D to prevent the disease. Right because if I make sure they never have a low vitamin D level, then they won't get diabetes. When they do those studies, they use a fixed dose. None of the hormones are using a fixed dose. For instance, if I said, Judy, you just told me your hair is falling out and you have these palpitations and you're in a really terrible mood and your sleep is affected. And I say, you know what? That sounds like a thyroid problem, Judy. Why don't you run on down to CVS and buy some thyroid hormone and I'll see you back in a year you would go, wait, my auntie got really screwed up when her thyroid levels were right. Aren't you supposed to draw some blood and see what my thyroid level is? Because every single hormone in our body stays within a maintained level. Too much is bad, too little is bad. As we in medicine have started to use hormones as pharmaceuticals. So as soon as I make a thyroid hormone and I give it as a pill, as soon as I use testosterone and give it as a cream or estrogen, our patients come back and say, you know, I don't feel good in the following ways. 
That means the doctors actually learn that too low and too high are both wrong, that there's a normal, sustained, what's called homeostatic level that's maintained in the body. We're gonna use these as drugs. We have to follow that same logic.